Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome once again to Whisper and Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Study. And here with me this morning, I have Elder Leslie Ellis and Dr. Kavola Ellis. Good morning, Elder Ellis. How are you doing? This is Wednesday, middle of the week. And how has your week been going? My week has been going wonderfully. I want us to thank God for bringing us, for sparing lives to see the middle of the week. Today is what they call the hump day. Once one gets over this, we head towards the Sabbath. Okay, and Dr. Ellis, how has your week been going? My week has been going great. Thank you very much. God has been good, and it is a joy to be on this platform. Okay, so we're studying this week extreme heat, extreme heat, and our study for today is surviving through hope, surviving through hope. But before we go into our lesson this morning, we're going to invite Elder Ellis to pray for us and Dr. Ellis to read for us our memory text for this week. I'll we pray. Father in heaven, once again, we want to thank you for waking us up this morning, this wonderful Wednesday morning, so that we can give you praise and thanks. Lord, this is a present, this is a gift, so that we could have gotten up, been aroused by you. We pray now that as we go into the study of your word, that your Holy Spirit will inspire our minds. And that you will help us to rightly divide the word of truth. We are studying a very, very important topic. And, oh God, grant that each of us will be blessed. And may we glean something from this lesson that would help us to build better characters in Jesus' name. Amen. And our memory text says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his day. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Isaiah 53, 10 from the New King James Version. Thank you very much. Just before we go into a lesson, I'm trying now to incorporate some of the comments our followers or viewers leave behind after your presentations and so at your last presentation we are looking at the enduring legacy and at the end of the lesson Bib Galloway Bib Galloway said good morning all thank you all for your everyday glorious explanation of the daily Sabbath school lesson. God bless you. And then Barbara Buckley had this to say, yes, God always makes a way through our crucible and guides us, our steps in thorns in our flesh. Thank you for being our shepherd. Amen. And that had to do with the comment you made on that last lesson study with the LSAs. So those are comments I'm going to try every week to pick out two of the comments that they have made on that particular day's lesson and so that they can know that we appreciate them participating in our discussion. So we're going to move right into our lesson this morning and Elder Ellis, I'm starting with you today and we're looking at we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to ensure so that we despair of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we may not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And that is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and it's verses 8 and 9, and I've read from the New International Version. Elder Ellis, what is Paul communicating here to us? We were all under great pressure, far beyond our ability. 
to endure. Didn't God say that he's not going to give us more than we can bear? That's true. God said that he wouldn't give us more than we can bear. But the Apostle Paul, who is a soldier of the cross, a champion in ministry and everything, one who has written so much in the New Testament, Paul is saying, through some of the struggles he went through, he's writing here, we were under great pressure. Can you imagine Paul saying that? Who is supposed to be a mature Christian? It just goes to show that regardless of the level of our maturity, we are human. And the devil, as we studied two uh, weeks back, one of the crucibles or, or one of the four crucibles mentioned there was a crucible of Satan. Satan is out to pressure God's people, to pressure Christians. And even, the, well, Jesus went through pressure. And so followers of Jesus will go through that. So Paul is saying we were under great pressure. One Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, we were overwhelmed, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired. I checked that word despair. And that word despair say utter loss of hope. Can you imagine that? And we are studying here uh, today. The theme is surviving through hope. Yet Paul is saying here that the suffer utter loss of hope of life itself. Indeed, we felt, and that word felt, it just goes to show, we can't trust our feelings. We can't trust our perception. Indeed, we felt we had received, as it were, the death sentence. But then he goes on to say, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. After going through all this pressure and so on, Paul's conclusion in verse 9 was that this was done for our good so that we would not rely on ourselves, but we would see that our perception could be wrong, our feelings could be wrong. We need to put our trust in God, not in feelings not in perception. Dr. Ellis, why, again, the question, we are on the pressure. And I, it, it takes me back to a previous lesson that we studied, that Job, God said he was perfect before him. We are child, we are on the pressure. But it's not to make us, let us say, in Paul's situation, it wasn't to make him perfect because God said he was upright. He was boasting about him. Then why still do we go through pressure? It seems to be suggesting here that we may not rely on our own selves. What does that say? Actually, it is interesting that Paul made himself so vulnerable. And I appreciated the way he exposed his vulnerability and his depression, as I will call it, because when he considered the church in Corinth, and believe it or not, as a gospel worker, I understand what Paul was going through. I mean, the church in Corinth was really going through some very up and down spiritual experience. And he was here more or less writing to them an epistle of reconciliation. So he had to expose himself and he let them understand, look, this is not an easy journey. We have been pressured so severely that at times we were so sure we would not have made it, but we relied upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And in another part, he said, and your prayers kept on comforting us. So Paul was really a person who was not afraid to say, I am human. 
I feel very, very insecure and unsure at a particular time, but I rely on God because there was no other way. There was no hope. And I like the fact that God brings us to the place where our backs are against the wall because most of us like to have a backup plan, plan B. And uh, we know plan B is not as strong as plan A, but at least we have plan B. So God has a way of eroding all those plans that our only plan is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying here, we did not think we were going to make it. We felt we were not going to make it, but we lie, relied on the Lord and he himself brought us through. So... It is beautiful to know that he is human. It is beautiful to know that as strong as he was, as fervent as he was, he was like all of us, experienced times of real severe crucible. And he depended on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, we're going to dig deeper. And we are going to look at Paul a little more and what he states about the reason for receiving God's compassion and comfort. Keep you near the cross And may your troubles show that you need God And may your battles in And may your bad day. Welcome back. We're going to go to Dr. Ellis now. Dr. Ellis, could you read for me 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4? Who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And the question is, Dr. Ellis, to what extent might suffering be a call to ministry? And that's a very interesting question because it takes suffering sometimes to help us to really recognize who we are in Christ. It takes suffering to peel off the layers and help us to be so dependent upon Christ that we can listen to what he is saying to us. And those um, those pressures with the comfort from God who, who, who comforts us and sustains us help us to be able to comfort others, which is, you know, a ministry in itself. Because when we can provide healing and comfort and assurance to others that in itself is a ministry so god permits us because he knows his purpose for our lives and most of the times we don't even know the purpose for our own lives but as we continue to surrender ourselves to god he continues to expose us to ourselves by putting us through the furnace and burning out the dross. And as the heat gets more and more intense, we become more and more dependent upon God and begin to understand clearly what suffering is all about. So we are able to help others, not theoretically, but we are able to help them experientially because we've been there ourselves. So I will say that suffering really helps us to recognize our calling, especially in ministry. And Ellis, the other question coming out of that particular text is how could we become more alert to this possibility? Referring to Dr. Ellis, summation on the passage and Paul's of Paul's comments. You know, I 
look at it from a practical sense. A drunkard who perhaps suffers from cirrhosis of the liver and experiences God-saving grace, that drunkard can empathize with persons who may be hooked on alcohol and move to ministry in this regard because they have gone through it. And because they have gone through it, they know the consequence of what their lifestyle was and what it has become. The other thing is that they know that there is hope for that person who is hooked on the bottle. And so they may go or they would be propelled to go after people who are in the situation they were in. I remember some time ago, I witnessed a Rasta guy. And what this Rasta guy, he was studying his Bible. I was doing call portraying and he picked up uh, Bible readings for the home that I was selling as a companion book to somebody else. Whilst I was trying to push to have and to hold, this Rasta guy was there going through Bible readings for the home. And then he came across the Sabbath. He came across the sanctuary. He said, wait, this book tell you about all of this? I said, yes. He said, how much for the book? And I was there trying to tell him, the only way you can get that book, that book is a free book. The only way you can get it is if you buy it to have and to hold. He said, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in this book. Eventually, I worked out the price to him. He said, but I don't have the money at this moment. I found out where he lived and so on. And he said, come such and such a time, I'll pay you. So by the time I went to his home to collect the money and so on, this guy started questioning me and we sat down and we started having Bible study and so forth. The bottom line is, he started to go to church. The same church I was going to and we started having conversation. However, he requested baptism, he was baptized, and then the two of us started working together in the environment that he used to go and sell drugs. So when we went there, what you found was that people, when they looked through the window and they saw us together, they took me for a policeman. I used to dress and cut my hair in such a way they thought I was a policeman. <laughs> and so they would slam their door and thought that this guy had turned informer, an, an informant now. No, he wasn't an informer. So you would tell me, look, 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 I've changed my lifestyle and so on. This brother here, we are working together because I have realized where I've come from, and I want to see other people saved. To cut a long story short, this guy started holding the crusades. We migrated. We left him when we went back. We saw after a few years, his name was there as one of the persons who became first elder of the church. The bottom yeah. line is, because of where he came from, when his life was transformed, when the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and he accepted Christ, he was moved to ministry for the folks that they were of like mind before. And so the question there is, how could we become more alert to this possibility? What it does for us, if there is suffering as a result of the consequence of our lifestyle, we become more empathetic and sympathetic towards people who are going through the same situation. And it becomes a work of ministry for those who have accepted Jesus Christ. And the thing about it is, they can share, we can all share our experience. And that is witness, that is ministry. Witnessing is saying what we know. We have been there, we have done that, and therefore we are better able to communicate the gospel in that regard. A former prostitute can reach prostitutes. A former whatever situation that one may have found themselves in. A former person who was a thief that ended up in prison, and they can go back and work for people of that sort of situation. And you be, we become more sympathetic. We can work more with people along that line because we have felt 
the grace of God in that regard. It seems that Paul was saying also in this passage that he drew strength or hope from the way these believers endured persecution. Is that what he was saying here? Yes, he also was saying that because he drew strength also from the persecution that he would have gone through. Because earlier, what we saw, Paul went through a lot of things. He suffered stripes, stripes so many times he was beaten. He was imprisoned. He had death threats. He was stoned once. He was shipwrecked. All these things Paul went through. And he came to the realization that God brings deliverance from whatever we face once we put our trust in him. And so strength is drawn from the crucibles that we go through. As Ellen White says, our crucibles are like educators to teach us and so that we can embrace more the grace of God. Dr. Ellis, just a minute before we go to the next session. How might we, from our strength, trusting in God, give hope to someone else? People have the tendency of looking to see how we are handling our situations. And uh, the way sometimes they look at us and say, how is it that you're able to go through that without complaining? But the thing is, when we are wrapped in Christ, I'm not certain why we don't feel the pain like a normal person will feel it. I think because we just continuously transfer that to the Lord. And I'm not sure if I'm talking about myself alone. So I know of many times when people say, how is it that you, you don't say anything or you, you can go through this? And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? So when people see the way we can be calm, the way we can be smiling, the way we can love, the way we can forgive, the way we are patient, the way we can just be able to understand the situation, even when it is not in our favor, it really does bring a certain level of awareness to them. And so therefore it is a ministry in itself. It is, it is a gospel in itself to that person. And they yearn to know the God we serve or to know the, the, the method or what principle or what is the secret that we are using that we can be this way, whether it's in pain, whether it's in is losing a job, whether it's in any situation. I have found from my own personal experience that I just transfer it to Jesus. And sometimes I feel kind of funny to say it, but it is true. I am able to forgive to love, to understand, to go, to go on, to bear pain, to, to not complain much, because I know there is a reason. I know that God has a reason for it. I know that he is going to bring me through. And when I read of Paul, it is with such assurance. Paul, beyond the shadow of a doubt, even when he thought he would die, it's okay because he will be dying in Christ, but he knows that God is going to work his purpose out, however he cares to work it out. So we ought to be so comfortable in the Lord that however he wants to work it out, he works it out. But what we must be sure of is that we are dependent on him and we are representing him. And I think people cannot help to see and to admire and to want to know the God we serve. As a matter of fact, it is very easy to speak to people because our lives are such examples. So it brings them reassurance and comfort. 
So that has brought us to the end of our second session. We are going to move right into our personal reflection and life application section when we get back. Many tears and sorrows Had questions for tomorrow There have been times I didn't know right from wrong But in every situation God gave blessed consolation That my trials come to only make me Welcome back to our final session of personal reflection and life application. And Elder Ellis, I'm going to go first with you and Dr. Ellis will close off this morning. The question to both of you is, what can you learn from Paul that can help you keep from falling into self-pity amid your own struggles? Blessings, I have learned or I can learn from Paul. I think Paul brought it down into like three areas in the study here. And I like those areas. One area is that, and this is why I said it also, that I have nothing to fear except I forget the way God has led, the way God has delivered me in the past. In fact, the lesson says, and that's one of the areas that Paul had confidence in, God has a proven track record. God has delivered me in the past, and so I have gained a level of maturity from his past deliverance to know that he has done it then, he will do it now and he will do it again, bring deliverance. That's one area. The other area is perseverance or determination. In other words, I must be steadfast in clinging to Jesus Christ. From that comes my rock and my salvation. It comes my, my strength. And you know, Paul also made reference to the prayers of the brethren. So we can look at this thing from a, per I can look at it from a personal way where I bear certain things and take it to Jesus. But even though there is personal devotion, there is also a corporate devotion that is very, very important. There are certain things that we need to share and ask for support, ask for the prayers of those that we love, ask for the prayers of the brethren so that we also can be strengthened. I have learned that from Paul. And if Paul could have given credence to the prayers of the brethren, I think I can learn that lesson also. Thank you, Elder Ellis, for your contribution to this week's lesson. Dr. Ellis, your response to this question this morning. I want to agree with Elder Ellis. And I mean, when Paul talking about the track record, it's a proven track record through the patriots and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself, how he has always delivered. He has never failed to deliver. And when we look at Paul's fix, his, his, his determination, he fixes his concentration. Paul was a preacher of the gospel and he did not feel anything save for the saving of the church, the protection of the church, even though there were many churches, I mean, small home cells. Paul wrote to them as though it was one church. He was concerned about the church. And then he was concerned about the intercessory prayer. He really loved it. So I am a woman that I love to fast a lot. Nobody knows about it because I just do it. And because our lives are so busy around this place, nobody knows when you eat and when you don't eat. So I, I really like to spend some personal time with the Lord. And I know that sometimes to intercede for others, 
we really have to spend some time emptying ourselves so that we can truly give it all to Christ that he can work on our behalf. But it just goes to show, even though the world is so large, people from any part of the globe can be praying for us and God responds to their prayer. It's like if we can say, okay, fine, God can respond to as if he doesn't know what's going on. But he does really appreciate or respect or, or rewards our faithfulness as we pray for others. So I personally would love to know that we can continue to pray for others. We can write their names down on, on a list. We can pray for them day by day by day and watch God work in their lives. Sometimes we just pray at random, God bless everyone in the community and all of that. We don't know what those results are. But when we look at them and Paul was able to say, thank you for your prayer, it added comfort to me. So we should also recognize when people are praying for us and and acknowledge the, the results of those prayers in our lives. So I thank God for the life of Paul, and I thank God for the way he made himself vulnerable so that we can relate to his experience. So I want to thank Dr. Ellis and Elder Ellis for so comprehensively bringing the truths out of today's lesson. And so I pray that you were blessed. wanted to like this study and we also want you to subscribe click that notification bell so god bless you have a wonderful day